Kids do a great job. Wasn't that amazing? I was kind of hoping they were going to stay. It'd be a lot more fun with them in the room. I'm not saying that you're not fun. I'm just saying would have been a lot more fun with them in the room. Hey, if you have your Bible today, going to ask that you take those out or turn those on. Uh, if you do not have a copy of God's Word, you can always download that from the Bible app. It is the number one downloaded app in all of the world. And I uh, would encourage you to have that on your phone. Uh, but all the verses will also appear on the screen this morning. Uh, turn to Psalm, uh, that is in the uh, Old Testament, the book of Psalms, but Psalm number 102 this morning, uh, Psalm 102 verse 18, here's what you are stepping into, uh, part two of this thought of how are you an ambassador at home? How are you an ambassador with your family? Uh, And I said this last week, Billy Graham, the great evangelist, said this, the hardest place to live out your faith is in your home with family. And so we're, we're trying to navigate what does it look like to be an ambassador in your home or an ambassador with your family. And so Psalm 102 verse 18 is uh, really just a springboard verse for us today. Here's what we said last week. A lot of theology around what does it look like to be an ambassador at home. Today, a lot of practical just uh, ways for you to be a parent and or for those of you uh, who are in this category, impacting the next generations, right? Uh, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor over in the West. It was great being with you guys. Some of the great patriotic songs that we were singing. Uh, For those of you in the West, also for all of you, if you would stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 102, verse 18 says this. Let this be recorded for a generation to come. Uh, There there are seven partner churches that we have, and uh, every single Sunday morning, I always send those guys a a text and a little encouragement, and and here's the thought really today. Some of you, just by being here today, uh, the Lord could so work in your heart, in your life, that it's going to change generations to follow you. Like you, you may not know who they're ever going to be, but because of today, that's why it's important, the psalmist says, to record this uh, for you to share so that a generation to come, so that a people yet to even be created may praise the Lord. Wouldn't it be great that praise doesn't stop with you? That praise doesn't stop with your generation, but that maybe for some of you, it starts with you and it continues for generations. You know, every parent, uh, you must ask this fundamental question. Here's the question. Am I parenting by circumstances and chance or on purpose with a plan? And I'm going to tell you, if you want to have a a godly impact for generations to come, you're going to have to parent on purpose with a plan, all right? So as you, some of you are parenting, others of you are impacting a next generation, you need to make some commitments that you do so uh, out of passion and purpose so that they can become mature, faith-filled adults who love Jesus who love others, and who love you. And here's the thing as we talk about all of this today. Um, Enjoy the process. And and here's what everyone in the West would say to you today. Remember, it's just a phase. It's just a phase they're going through, all right? And I promise you this, uh, that phase is going to be over a lot quicker than you're going to believe. And every person in the West just started clapping and saying amen, all right? Hey, let's pray together and we'll continue. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being an ambassador. And Lord, a lot of times we think about an ambassador going somewhere, doing something, almost leaving. But Lord, many of us forget or possibly just neglect that one of the greatest places that we can be an ambassador is in our own home. And so, Lord, I pray that you would teach us 
What does that look like? Give us some practical ways that we can do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There was a great uh, author. Uh, he, he was a part of the Inklings. His name was G.K. Chesterton. And, and here's what he said in regard to family. It's almost like God drops you down a chimney and says, okay, get along with all of the people in that house. Um, now, he is a deep intellectual writer. So I am shocked uh, that that was his statement when it came to being a part of a family, especially an ambassador in a family. I, I think there's much more to it than just that. Matter of fact, Parenting is going to cover these four distinct stages. We're going to refer to them as phases determined by your children's ages and evolving needs. Now understand that these stages or these phases should serve as a foundation for your parenting approach with this as your primary goal, right? Fostering strong spiritual and emotional connections with your children. Like, how do we do that? So if you see parenting, uh, you have to see it beyond just authority. You have to see it beyond just you always winning the arguments, right? It revolves around a couple of things. Nurturing. It revolves around kindness and compassion. And at the end of the day, It's you trying to shape these individuals who have been gifted to you for a season. And that's probably uh, the hardest thing, especially for young parents to understand, that it's a season who will passionately love Jesus. It's often been quoted, when they are little, you want them to grow up. But when they grow or grown up... You'll want them to be little again. So so as a parent, uh, there are these moments when you believe your kids are never going to grow up, right? You almost go from, um, I can't wait for. I can't wait for their first words. I can't wait for their first steps. I can't wait for the first day of school. And then all of a sudden you go to, I can't believe this is the last. I can't believe this is their last day of school. I'll never forget, for Sharon and I, it happened when our oldest son, J. Michael, started driving. Uh, For all of their life, I always made sure I was the one who took them to school or to preschool or whatever those activities may have been. That just gave me uh, that special time in the car with them. And so one day, uh, I came downstairs in the uh, townhome that we lived in in Seminole, and uh, I asked Sharon, like, where are the boys? And she says, well, they're they're gone, like they've left already. And I'm thinking, that's not possible because I'm here, so they should be here. And she said, don't you remember? Like, this is J. Michael's first day driving to school. And I thought, wow. And I've got to be honest with you. I cried the whole way to work, not crying because they were not there, crying because I can't believe that I thought those days were going to last forever because it had almost felt like forever. Uh, I thought those days were going to last forever. And then all of a sudden, just like that, um, they were no more. That's why we decided to have Zeke and uh, to do it like all over again, right? (laughs) So the lesson That every parent, and there's many of you in here, a lot of you over in the West, every parent of an adult child, here's what they would tell you. Don't fast forward through the phases. Don't fast forward. Don't do that, all right? After all, it's just a stage. It's just a phase. And every one of them will tell you, it's going to go by quick enough. Don't fast forward it, all right? So let's take a look. First of all, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at the four phases or the four stages of parenting. And and then I'm going to share with you uh, some things Sharon and I tried. Um, We we tried our best, but some things we tried to do as parents. Many of those we learn from even some of you or from mentors in our own life. So let's look at the four stages or the four phases first. First of all, you have what, what many refer to as the discipline years. Ages one through five, really. Uh, I call it the what years. Because every question is, what is that? 
what is that? What, and you don't think you're ever going to stop answering, what is that? Now, a couple of things. It's motivated by safety. You are their protection. You are their provider. So you have to embrace their physical needs. Now, this is the phase where uh, you do everything for them. Uh, you almost feel like you lose yourself a little bit because it seems like everything you do is about meeting their needs. And listen, uh, it can be stressful for parents, especially if you are a first-time parent. This stage is mainly about strengthening your child's obedience muscles. And you have to somewhat do so with some consequences, right? It's these years that here's what's going to happen. All of a sudden, they're going to start running away from you, right? Have you ever been to the international mall? As you get older, you don't necessarily go there to shop. You just go there to watch, right? And it's great to see the first-time parents, and they take their son or daughter out of whatever that thing is they're traveling in. They used to just be a stroller, but man, they're so fancy. That it's amazing. And they, you take them out, and the first thing that child does is what? They want to run, and then you can hear, my, no, 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 you got to come back. And you can tell, like, they don't know. Do I want to come back or do I want to just keep running? And, and what you're doing in those discipline years is teaching them. It's always safe to come back. And, and look, that's not just for their physical needs. You're also teaching them a great spiritual lesson that God always welcomes us back. It's a great thing that you're teaching there. Now, although it may sometimes seem like a daunting and tiring phase, it's crucial to keep in mind the moments are going to pass swiftly, right? Again, another recognizable saying, the days are long, but the years are short. And, and parents, I would just remind you, you only have so many of those. You only have so many tooth fairies. You only have so many, the word that starts with an S. Uh, you only have so many that you get to dress them up for uh, trick-or-treating or what birthdays, whatever the case may be. You only have a limited number of those, right? Uh, so remind yourself how quickly Time passes. Now, what would you do spiritually here? Here's what I would recommend. Uh, videos at this time are going to be very engaging, right? Um, also, reading to them books, but I would encourage you to use the Bible app. Uh, there is a kid's version to the Bible app that is super engaging, especially for kids in this age. Also, uh, our church has purchased for you, so you've purchased for us, uh, Right Now Media. So you have full access to everything in Right Now Media. Right Now Media, in case you do not know, is basically the equivalent to uh, a Christian Netflix. But you don't have to pay for it. We pay for it for you. If you don't have that, uh, make sure you contact us, and we would love to make sure you have Right Now Media. All right, so we go from the discipline years, remember that's what, to the training years, ages 5 to 12. That is the why. So remember those first years, everything is what is that, right? Now you've got to answer, why do I have to do that? And so there's a change that takes place. This is motivated by fun, uh, but you have to start engaging their interests. So as your child begins to enter into what we're going to call the training years or the why years, right? Uh, they become more capable of understanding the reasons behind the rules. Now, it doesn't mean they like that, but they start to understand, unlike in the discipline years where they just don't know why that is a rule, okay? Uh, and remember, we said this last week. We're going to say it again. Rules without relationship is going to equal rebellion, okay? Explaining the why behind the what is critical to helping them grasp the importance of making good choices and then turning those good choices into good habits. And here's the thing, parents. You can't just respond with, because I said so. Like, that's not good enough at this stage. You, you need to take the time to explain 
why you said so. Like, why? Remember what the Bible says, thus saith the Lord, right? Well, why did the Lord say that? And the Bible tells us. And same thing behind your, because mom or dad said so, why? What's the authority behind that? So it's okay to share that. In this phase, you're going to, you're still micromanaging. Understand that, all right? Still micromanaging your child's life. You're giving direction. Uh, you're, you're helping them make decisions for their safety. My favorite saying during this time is no, but thank you for asking, all right? That's my favorite. No, but thank you for asking. And now let me explain the reason behind the no. By the way, once you say no, a lot of times they're just going to tune you out to whatever that reason is, right? Because they just want to hear yes. The training years can be exceptionally challenging, especially when those of you in the room are dealing with a tween on the brink of adolescence, right? And you're like, what happened to my like sweet little baby? <laughs> uh, what happened to our sweet son or daughter? And all of a sudden, hormones start to surge and your child begins to assert their individuality. But here's the key. Reflect on the choices that they make that reflect your affection. Like, what are those things that are dear to you? And, and, and it should be two things. Your faith and your family. Right, And so every time they make a good decision in regard to their faith or in regard to the family, always make sure you celebrate that. Many of you may recall several years ago, uh, we had uh, Bob Tebow come and share with us. Bob, obviously, uh, Tim Tebow's father. And one of the things that Bob Tebow shared with us is this. Uh, they don't give any of their kids an allowance, right? Now, I would hope at this stage, uh, at least Tim is giving his parents an allowance. Like, that would be nice. They're probably wanting that. But Mary said, we don't give our kids allowance. But here's what we do. If someone comes up to us and they share a story about one of our kids' faith, or they share a story about something that our kids did that is a part of our family, right? Like our family, that's what we stand for, helping someone or serving someone. Then, then we would always give them money for that. And then, of course, the Tebow's mentioned, Bob mentioned with us, that, that you got to catch on because all of a sudden, you, you know, your son or daughter has the same people that they would send and go, hey, tell them this story, get some more money, we'll split it, right? Now, obviously, here's what he's saying. Like, you want to celebrate that. Celebrate other people bragging, seeing your kids living out their faith and or your family values. Uh, spiritually, here's what I would recommend. Now you need to start leading in devotions. Like don't, don't allow somebody else to do so. Okay, that, that's again, we talked about this last week, but that's not just the one week of VBS. Uh, here's what we did. I had all boys and, and then I started, we called it chapel. Uh, so, so I would come through, um, just like I would do at, at a, uh, in the big leagues, I would come through and go, hey guys, chapel in five, we got chapel in five minutes. Now listen, uh, one of our sons would say, yeah, I'm not going to be able to make it. Um, and I'm not like, where are you going? <laughs> uh, I know your schedule. Like, yeah, I'm not going to be able to make chapel. So you just need to understand, you've got to be consistent with it regardless, all right? And, and, and this is where maybe uh, you're still using uh, like the Bible app or another Devo, but, but I tell you, it's also great where you're sharing your own devotions with them where you're showing them your soap for the day. Uh, again, that doesn't have to be a, a, a sermon, right? Like that can be a minute, two minutes, three minutes. But spiritually, you really need to be engaged with them. Number three, we have what's called the coaching years. This isn't what, this isn't why, this is how. This is how. Uh, this is tough because it's motivated by acceptance. And you have to now start acknowledging their own personal journey, right? The coaching years are marked by your child's own growing independence, uh, where they're starting to make their own friends. Um, they're starting to select their own music. Uh, they're engaging in their own activities. Now, here's what's tough for parents. You don't get to play this game for them. You're the coach in this game. You don't get to play. 
You have to coach. You have to coach them to help them as they're navigating this phase. So here's what's paramount. Effective communication. But here's what's amazing. Now, it's been a long time since I was a youth pastor, right? Uh, So Michael would tell you. Here's what happens when you hit ages 12 to 18. The communication stops. They need you to communicate with them more now than ever. Here's the problem. Just like with you and your spouse, you have to find the right time, the best time to communicate. Right? It's probably ugh, not going to be your best time. You got to find their best time. But communication becomes paramount in the coaching years. Engaging in open and even non judgmental conversation, meaning this you're not just there to give an answer, you're there to coach them, all right, to help them to find. So you're fostering an environment where your child feels comfortable uh, sharing their thoughts and their experiences with you. By the way, if you have not done so already at this stage, it, it, it is so important that you're asking the four H questions, okay? I would tell you, start this a lot earlier, but if you have not started it, it's not too late to start it. We ask every married couple, like, sometime throughout the day to ask these questions to each other, but here's what I would ask you. Where do you want your kids to go for answers? Do you want them to go to YouTube, to Google, to their friends, or to you? Uh, every parent I've ever asked that to has said, oh, I would like them to come to me. Well, if you're not setting a time now that they can come to you with their questions, when is that going to happen when they're in the coaching years? It's going to be tough. That doesn't mean you can't do it, okay? But you're going to have to start doing it now. And it may look something like this. Hey, I need to apologize to you. You know, there, I, I should have continued the communication process with you, but for some reason... I don't know. I, I just thought maybe I, I wasn't uh, uh, who you needed to go to. And, and so I'm going to start asking you some questions every day. What are those four questions? Here they are. How is everything in your head? This is the intellectual question. Is there anything going on in the world that they have questions about? Right Now, if they have questions about the debate on Wednesday, I don't know who can answer those. Uh, but if they have questions about anything, this is intellectually. And here's what you have to do. You can't be sarcastic during that. And you can't put them down for whatever the question may be. So don't go, oh my gosh, you don't know the answer to that? Well, if you do that, guess what? They're not coming back to you the next time. All right. So whatever question they ask, you have to be serious. Number two, how is everything in your heart? This is the emotional question. Every time I do premarital or marital counseling, every time, the lady always says, he doesn't share his emotions with me. Okay, well, let's ask a question where he's going to be forced to share his emotions with you, right? Uh, So what is that? How is everything in your heart? Meaning, how are you feeling about this? Okay, question number three is this. How is everything in our home? And this is a great time. Maybe, you know what? It seems like recently um, I'm doing a lot more of the household responsibilities than you are. I'm not sure what, how like, can we talk about? Hey, you know what? Seems like it's been a, we haven't even talked about what we're going to do, you know, in the summer or uh, during Christmas break. Like, that's a good time for you to start planning things in your home, all right? And then the last question. I added this within the last couple of years, really post-COVID. How is your health? Physically, how are you doing, all right? But also spiritually, how are you doing? Okay, so I would say this, if you're married, like these are questions you should ask, but for those of you who have kids, these are questions that you should be asking them. Uh, Now, let me tell you, I have all boys, so let me tell you how this goes. Good, 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 good. That's it. But guess what? Keep asking. Keep asking. Keep asking. Um, We were on uh, Beach Week two years ago. And uh, Sharon and I, and and Zeke was out by the beach, and uh, Zeke said, hey, Dad, can we walk down the beach? He's never in his life asked if we could go walking down the beach, right? I'm like, sure. And so we go walking down the beach, and, and all of a sudden he says, can you ask the questions? I'm like, what are you talking about? You know the questions. Can you ask? I can ask them to you, but could you ask the questions? I said, sure. How's everything in your head? Good. 
I'm not sure what we're doing. Uh, how's everything in your heart? Good. I'm like, again, not positive. Now, I'm not saying it out loud, but inside I'm going, I'm not sure what we're doing right now. And then I say, how's everything in our home? And he stops. And he goes, I know sometimes you get upset with me that I don't like going out, that I just like staying home. But can I just tell you, our home is the safest place in the world, and I just like being safe. And he's like, okay, we can go now. And it was over, right? <laughs> Now, I understand through others that a lot of times, for those of you who are, are raising young ladies, you get a lot more of that. I just want to make sure that parents of sons know you may just get good, 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 good. Keep going at it, all right? Keep asking. So in this phase, uh, you are the coach. So you're coaching more than you're correcting like you did in the first two stages, Right? Like, you want to coach them through the decisions. You become the voice described by God in Isaiah 30, verse 21. Now, we want that to be the spirit, but we also want it to be your voice. Listen to Isaiah 30, verse 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, our ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Now, of course, we want the spirit living inside of them to do that. But mom and dad, you always want to make sure your voice is there. That even when they're not with you, because remember, you're coaching. That's why it's important. you got to transition. You can't live this for them, right? Because if you're not there to make every decision, guess what? More than likely, then they're going to make a bad decision because they don't know what that looks like. You've never, give, you've never coached them in that opportunity. So you want to coach them. Uh, I'm going to tell you, for those of you in this stage, uh, it's a really wise thing for you to do, a smart idea, that you would embrace an outside voice during this time. Another reliable voice that's not yours, that's not a parent, that has the same biblical worldview that you do, and that they can reinforce the values and the morals that both you and the church are trying to impact. Uh, for my two oldest boys, this is what it looked like. I would text them a verse every day. Text them a verse every day. I didn't get a K. I didn't get a thumbs up. I got nothing, right? And so one day, like most families, we are experiencing a, a family conflict. And, and I, look, I, I am confessing to you. It's much easier to share with you than to pay for the counselor. So I'm sharing with you. Uh, I was festering that, right? Like, I never had a dad. And as your dad, I send you a You don't even care. So I said to them in those moments, oh, yeah? Well, how about this? I text you guys a verse every single day, and you don't even respond. And the one who would miss chapel the most said, well, yeah, but that's because Dr. Smith sends us a verse, and we respond to his. I went, what? He goes, yeah. Every day, there was an ear doctor uh, over in Pinellas County who went to church with us who had great influence, not only on our two oldest sons, but, but about seven or eight of their friends. And so he had them all in a group text, and every morning he would send them a verse. And guess what? They would thumbs up it. They would like it. They would respond to it. Why? They just needed another voice. And that's okay. Because every person would tell you, you need more than one coach. Right? It's okay to have that. Um, then you move into the friendship years. I put this, when, that's the when, W-H-E-N. But I went, it's more like the when, W-I-N. Uh, when you get there, you win. It's motivated by freedom, but you're mobilizing their potential. Uh, this is going to, to set some of you free. You are responsible to them. Uh, you're responsible for providing for them, for protecting them, for training them, for raising them. But you're not always responsible for them. And sometimes, even though you may do everything right, but you're going to blame yourself for this. They could make decisions that are not right. And it's very difficult as a parent because you always think, did I do something wrong here? And you have to understand, you were responsible to them. But you're not always responsible for them. This phase is where you have to give them the keys. Um, they're going to make decisions. And this is why it was so important that you coach them. 
Because this is where you hope and trust and pray that the coaching pays off. Right? Uh, but the ultimate goal of parenting is this, to transition them to adulthood where it's really the friendship years that they own their own faith, they're living their own life, they have their own family, but they still want to spend time with you. And that's a pretty special place to be. So those are the four phases or stages of parenting. So real quickly, we want to look at like what are some things you can do, and especially for those of you maybe who do not have children. Like what are some things you can do, like uh, Robert Smith did for that group of young men. Like what are those things that you can do? Well, navigating the different stages and phases of parenting, from discipline to training to coaching to friendship, just understand uh, each stage is going to have challenges and joys right challenges and celebrations so remember there's always time to invest even if you didn't get it right during the discipline stages or the training stages or possibly even during the coaching stages there's always time for you to invest invest in the relationship uh, here's what I would tell you cherish the small insignificant moments they become the lasting memories. For those of us who have adult children, it's fun to sit around uh, July 4th that's coming up or uh, a Thanksgiving or a Christmas, and they start sharing stories. And a lot of times, it's the small, insignificant things that, that you go, what? That's what you guys remember? And that's what they want to talk about. So when Sharon and I found out that we were going to be parents, I've got to tell you, I was, uh, I was full of confidence. Uh, I'd been a youth pastor, hundreds of students in my ministry. Uh, I thought, like, how hard could this be? Matter of fact, uh, I had already looked at a lot of parents in judgment of going, like, if I was parenting your son or daughter, uh, they would be, you know, not only loving you and loving Jesus, they probably would have already saved the world. Uh, but then we ended up with three boys and talk about receiving an education. Uh, but here's what I can tell you God is gracious that's for all the parents God's gracious God's merciful to children and parents alike uh, so while raising our three boys and we are so excited uh, we are getting a girl added to the family in October uh, so that's part of the joy that we have in sharing um, yes so here's a, a couple strategies I want to give you, and we're going to move to this. Number one, bless your children. Bless your children. Uh, kids love praise, and they especially love it from parents, right? Matter of fact, I'm convinced that not only do they love it, they crave it. So as they grow up, they tend to gravitate towards adults who verify them. So you be that adult for them. Now, I just, TV, you know, we didn't get it right, but here's a couple of things we did. Number one, our, our boys were super engaged in sports, especially baseball. So here was, here was our practice. If the hat was on, we talked about baseball. If they took the hat off, we didn't talk baseball. Hat on, baseball. Hat off, we didn't talk about. It. Now, in other sports and other activities, you got to figure out what does that look like for you, right? But here's what I would tell you. Praise them. Okay, um, they're looking for it. They're craving it. So for children, there's no substitute for receiving the benediction or the blessing from a mom or a dad, especially during those formative years. And I really, uh, it, it's going to propel them. Uh, it will propel them to new heights spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, athletically, relationally, as they begin to see their uh, uh, image through the words that you speak as opposed to other words they hear spoken or they read. Remember this, Luke 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So here's, here's, something, here's how you bless them. Are they growing in those four areas? Are they growing intellectually in, in wisdom? Are they growing physically? Are they growing in favor with man? We would say socially. And then are they growing in favor with God? We would say spiritually. So, so those are the four areas where you want to have a goal for your children so that they can grow in those areas. What I would recommend there is that you're doing a weekly or monthly um, 
outing with your kids one-on-one, okay? Uh, Especially if you have boys, uh, I I would encourage mom at least once a month that you're taking them out. Um, And and, and for the the men, for the dads, uh, really, really encourage you to do a, a boys' night out or a date night with your daughter. Like, I'm just going to tell you, if they have never gone on a date and then you're going to send them out with some guy that you don't know, you're crazy. Like, they should have like that sh- they should have already been on like a thousand dates before they go on that date. And as soon as they're on that date and that person isn't dating them the way dad dating them, it's time for her to call home, right? Because the date is over. So bless your children. Number two, overcome negative family patterns. Look, this can be tough. Uh, For those of us who maybe grew up in a dysfunctional family, I want you to know, you can be a part of a transitional generation. And uh, you can be the one who can overcome uh, maybe mistakes of generations before you, and you can overcome uh, possibly bad behavior from the past. And and I would just say, um, be the cycle breaker. After all, we sing a song, Jesus is the chain breaker. And so allow the chain breaker to break the cycle in your family tree. But seriously, here's what I do want you to know. For some of you, you may have to get professional Christian counseling help for the hurts of your childhood. Like We encourage you to do so. But here's the thing. Start today establishing healthy traditions and examples for your own children. Romans 5.20 says this, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And for some of you, you're going to have to say, God, I'm going to need more grace here Uh, because I didn't have a good picture here. So I'm going to need you to help me, show me what does this look like. And therefore, create a grace-filled home. Grace and forgiveness, they shock us. They do. Uh, God forgave us while we were sinners. He shows grace and forgiveness to imperfect people. And then he continues to allow us to be used for his plans and purposes. So human nature is this. It is to prevent us from easily receiving or giving grace and forgiveness. Well, if I'm just super easy on them, then they're just going to run over me. And listen, no one is saying that you should be that parent. Trust me, we're going to get to that in just a second. But we do need to show grace. Like we need to show forgiveness and we need to show mercy. The greatest place for a child to learn grace and mercy and the difference between the two is in your home. And if they can learn that in your home, guess what? They're going to learn that with God. Because here's what we do. It's not fair, but we do this. All of us do this. We put human characteristics on a holy, divine God. Because that's how we saw mom do it. That's how we saw dad do it. So obviously, that's how God must do it. No, that's not how God does it. God is full of grace and mercy. And and it has to be given, um, and it has to be received. Remember what Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says? For I, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you of your sins. So tweens and teens especially, man, they need a safe place. And I'm going to tell you this, 99 out of 100% of the times, that place is where grace and forgiveness and love abounds. So if the environment of your home is negative or threatening, I I promise you this, sooner or later, when they get to make decisions, they're going to hang out where they feel welcome and wanted. So create an atmosphere in your home where love increases, where kindness is shown, and grace is experienced. Now, one thing I would uh, share with you. Um, every family needs what is now referred to as a code word. You need a code word. For if at any time, remember, especially in those coaching years, but if any time they feel unsafe, if they feel uncomfortable, or they just want to come home for whatever reason, 
there should be a word that only you and the family knows that they're going to call you and say that or they're going to text that to you and then here's what you do. You become the bad person. That's it. I've had enough. I'm coming to pick you up, right? You're going to text that. So if their friends have their phone, they're like, man, what did you? I don't know. My parents are crazy. You know them, all right? But but it's a code word, okay? And and you're helping them. And by the way, parents, you need to tell your, your sons and daughters, you can always blame me. Always put it on me. Okay, uh, but you need that. Uh, again, Romans 2, 4, the, the second part. Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. I got to tell you, growing up, I never heard that verse. I think they skipped right over it. I think they intentionally did not read Romans 2, 4. But you know what brings us to repentance? It's not the anger of the Lord. It's not the meanness of God. It's his kindness. When we're like, how can a holy God be so kind? And you as a parent need to show that. Uh, Communicate with A-W-E, awe, right? Affection, warmth, and encouragement. Uh, A healthy dose of awe works wonders for kids. You don't have to be a pushover parent. By the way, you need to hear this. Leniency does not equal love. Um, I, I experienced this uh, probably over 20 years ago. Uh, we, we had a, uh, a, a football player at Plant High School, and uh, he was 6'6", 315, because he had a t-shirt. And it said, before you ask, 6'6", 315, because everybody would say, dude, how big are you, right? So he had a t-shirt, 6'6", 315. And uh, he started coming to our church because I was, you know, working with the team off on the side and doing some character and chapel stuff for them. So he started coming. And it was great because no of the kids would sit with him. And he was always like right there all by himself. Like they were scared of him. I don't know. Uh, But he came to make a decision for Christ. And soon after that, he asked, hey, can I come see you? I was like, yeah, man, sure. So he came into my office. And the second he walked in and sat in that chair, he starts crying. Now listen, when someone 6-6-315 starts crying, like, man, he's shaking. He's moving, right? And I'm trying to pat him. Like, What's going on, big fella? And uh, here, here was his question. Why do my parents not love me? And of course, as a youth pastor, what was my response? Oh, come on. You know they love you. He said, do they? He said, you know what time my curfew is? I, I don't know, like 11, 30, 12. He went, no. I go, I, I don't know. He goes, yeah, nor do they. I don't have a curfew. He goes, do you know what I did last Friday and Saturday night? I'm like, read your Bible and prayed and fast. I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm hoping. He went, no. He goes, guess what? They don't know what I did either. He goes, and you're telling me that's love? Parents. Here's a 17-year-old kid who played football at UCF, who just came to know Christ, who understood leniency is not love. And so I would tell you, you got to communicate, though. Share affection, share warmth, share encouragement. Number five, raise kids who love God in themselves. The Apostle John tells us what we lo- that we learn love by looking at love. 1 John 4.10, and this is love. That not, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So look at the people, right? Look at their activities. Look at the things they're attached to. Look at what they sacrifice for. And I promise you, any person, if we follow you for a minute, we can say, oh, that's what you love. Well, so can kids. And and, and they know the areas of your life that you love. And children can see where your priorities are, right? So God's love, right, it helps us as parents to counteract our natural selfishness because at the end of the day that that's what most of us we're selfish sinners trying to do this thing so we need God's love now um, they're going to learn God's love most by you teaching showing them this so let me give you as we close the seven irreducible needs that every kid needs number one a true authentic faith like they don't need to see you Be someone on Sunday that you're not Monday through Saturday. Like if you want them to have an authentic faith, 
And we're not perfect. No one in the room. And a lot of times I have to confess to the Lord, confess to my wife, and then confess to my boys. But you have to show a true, authentic faith. Number two, spiritual habits. You're going to instill them, but the best thing that can happen is them catching you worshiping. Catch you reading your Bible. Catch you praying. Number three, healthy friendships. Relationships are going to greatly determine the quality and the direction of your kid's life. So it's important that you know who they are, right? Like that, that's your role, your responsibility, healthy friendships. Number four, moral boundaries. Um, God's boundaries are intended for their good, to help them, protect them, not to hurt or harm them. But you have to be the one to show, like, what are those moral boundaries? Number five, wise choices. Now, we said wise choices, not right choices. There's a big difference between what's right and what's wrong. What's wise? Like, what's the wise thing for me to do here? Number six, ultimate authority. You know, maximum freedom is found under God's authority. Like Jesus says, that if you know the truth, you will what? You're going to live this life of free. The truth sets you free. And then number seven, others first. Others first. Hey, I know uh, the last two weeks has been a lot. Uh, a lot of information on parenting. Um, but here's what I'm going to tell you. Regardless of what you've done so far, some of you, maybe you're like, man, you're doing it right some of you, you, you know, last two weeks, you're like, why, why even try? <laughs> like, I'm so far behind. Can, can I just tell you, uh, forget everything we've said in two weeks. And here's what I would tell you. Be there. Be there. Show up for them. Starting today. 1988, an earthquake in what was then known as the Soviet Armenia. It took only four minutes to really flatten a nation. The official death toll was only 25,000, but most estimate it was far more than that. Here's how one author described a moving scene from this horrible disaster. Moments after the deadly tremor ceased, a father raced to an elementary school to save his son. When he arrived, he saw that the building had been leveled. So looking out at the mass of stones and rubble, he remembered a promise that he had made to his child. No matter what, I'll be here for you. Driven by his own promise, he found the area closest to his son's room and he began to pull back the rocks. Other parents arrived and they began sobbing for their children and saying, it's too late, it's too late. Even a police officer came up to him and said, you know that they're all dead. But the father refused. One hour turned to eight hours. Eight hours to 16 hours. Then 32 hours. For 36 hours he dug. His hands were raw and his energy was gone, but he refused to quit. Finally, at the 38th hour, he pulled back a boulder and he heard his son's voice. He called his son, Armand, Armand, and a voice answered him, Dad, it's me. The boy then added these priceless words, Dad. I told the other kids not to worry. I told them that you promise, no matter what, I'll be there for you. Hey, mom and dad, no matter what, be there. Just be there. God, we uh, thank you that you are a loving heavenly father who is always there for us. God, you even tell us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, there are many challenges in this thing we call life. God, probably none more greater than this area of parenting or trying to impact the next generation. 
Lord, there's so many things to learn. There's so many things to do. And God, half the time, because of guilt and shame, we feel like we don't get it right. God, I pray today that every mom, every dad, every adult impacting the generation behind them would just do this one thing. Just always show up. Always be there. Never miss the moment. God, we love you. God, thank you for the sacrificial love that you've shown us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.